Thanks for the invitation, Mort. Really happy to be here. So, if we could have the slides. I was asked to speak on lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So I still have my current institution, at least for the next six weeks. So as you may know, Hodgkin lymphoma is more homogeneous than non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There really are just a handful of different types. And with the most common subtype being classical Hodgkin lymphoma, as you can see on the schematic on the left, although there is this one that's been pulled out, uh, the, the focus of this talk, called nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. I would say arguably there's a third bucket, or I'm sorry, before I talk about the third bucket, in the 2016 WHO, there is this uh, classification now for T-cell histiocytic rich large cell lymphoma transformation of nodular lymphocyte predominant. We've known for many years this can transform, and this is now an official name. The third bucket being gray zone lymphoma, mainly just because it has features of classical Hodgkin lymphoma and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, although as we and others have published, really should be viewed and treated more like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. That's, that's another talk. So quick case, you know, we uh, brought the, New Eng the lymphoma rounds by LRF that were started in Chicago. We brought it to New England. And this is a case we presented, or actually Dr. Abramson from MGH presented last year. So 35-year-old man being evaluated for right so shoulder surgery found to have adenopathy. The adenopathy was relatively asymptomatic an axillary lymph node biopsy was performed. So if you get the sense here, you have to almost look at it uh, like a diagram. You see two large nodules, but with a very homogeneous infiltrate, blue infiltrate throughout. But a smaller nodule on the left, a little bit larger on the right, with a diffuse infiltrate within. When you look at this in higher power, you see what looks to be small lymphocytes in what's called LP, or popcorn-like cells. They have scant, uh, scant cytoplasm, with polylobated nucleoli, uh, nuclei, and also you can see increased nuclei in them as well. How do they stain? Well, this is a small lymphocyte staining for CD20 there. At higher power, you see those popcorn-like cells staining strongly for CD20. But interestingly, surrounding, those are negative for this B-cell stain. It can either be follicular dendritic cells that surround it, or sometimes when you get a slightly more diffuse infiltrate like this case, it'll be surrounded by CD3 or CD4 follicular T cells. You can see these are little T cells surrounding it. So I'm not going to show you all the stains, but suffice it to say the large cells stain also for CD45, OC2, BOB1, PAX5, and Q1 which also helps, sometimes this can get confused sometimes with primary mediastinal large cell lymphoma, and it was negative for 30, 15, and Eber. Altogether, very classic case of a mixed nodular with diffuse pattern, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So this patient would have had, if I told you his PET scan and bone marrow were negative, would have had stage 2 disease. So think about how you would treat stage 2 nodular lymphocyte predominant. Well, just comparing and contrasting a little bit with one column you can see classical versus NLPHL, nodular lymphocyte predominant, you can see that the median age is a little higher versus the bimodal pattern we know with classical Hodgkin's. The m little bit more majority is male versus a little bit of a, a female predominance in nodular sclerosis with some male predominance in mixillarity in classical. In terms of stage, the high majority of lymphocyte predominant is early stage disease, so rather more uncommon to see advanced stage, but not impossible, a little less likely with B symptoms. And the course is, is I would say, variable. I would think of it a little more indolent, but it can transform, and you can see late relapses. And that's really one key difference. Uh, and I, I would say probably it's more in the range, even though some studies go up, as I'll show you in a minute, to 20, 30 percent transformation rate, the rate's probably closer to 10 percent, where it's pretty rare for hot classical Hodgkins to do that. So this is just a little bit more on the age, so it's definitely, we don't see the bimodal pattern like classical, and you kind of see the sweet spot, especially more commonly in men, in the 30s and 40s. So what about prognosis? You know, for many, many years, if not decades, many groups, including the German Hodgkin study group, just lumped all Hodgkin's lymphoma together, including nodular lymphocyte predominant. 
So they went back and pulled it out. Uh, here, you can see, interestingly, in their data set, it trended pretty similar, if not even a little higher than classical Hodgkin's, looking at freedom from treatment failure. And overall survival was even a little bit better. So suffice it to say, and these, what I can say is we're treated all by classical Hodgkin's paradigms. So this is one of the higher transformation uh, publications, I would say. It was retrospective from British Columbia. And you can see at the different points of times of actual actuarial risk of transformation, 7, 15, 31 percent. There is what everyone has shown, really kind of a plateau. If you do live 20 years with this, it's probably not going to transform after that. But you see this somewhat kind of every five years, a little bit of an increase in that transformation. What predicted for transformation, and this has been shown in several papers that have looked at this, that if there is one risk factor or prognostic factor, so to speak, it would be splenic involvement is one point. Second point, let's say it does transform to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The data would say once treated like a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the outcomes do not look different than if it was a de novo relapse diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The Mayo Iowa Spore actually looked at this, and so you can see, at least with a median follow-up of 16 years, their rate was 8% with the median time to transformation in their data set of about three years. Again, also predicting for splenic involvement, predicting, and they had some patients out to 40 years. You can see if you had splenic involvement, then the really interestingly, the 80% uh, of patients ultimately transformed versus only 13% without. So what about treatment? And really, I would say there, there is not one standard, of course, just like classical Hodgkin's. And I also say there aren't a lot of randomized studies, much less prospective studies, due to the uncommonality of this. And I didn't highlight it at the initial slide, but it's only about 5% of all Hodgkin's. And so there is pediatric literature for stage 1A disease for resection. You know, we don't really think of that, in, at least in the adult world, but they, there is this data it, that has been published. And when they say resection, so CR, meaning negative margins, thinking like a solid tumor resection, is one thing. And this did include stage 1A and 2, but what I can tell you is the vast majority of patients who were on that CR line were stage 1 neck, cervical. So the vast majority, there were a few supracovicular and an axillary in there but it mainly was stage 1A cervical. So I wouldn't say it's so wrong. It's, you, you do certainly, as you can see, have about 30% of patients who will relapse, but maybe if there is a patient who does not want even rituximab or other treatment, or I mean even radiation, I would say at least would be a, on the uh, option as a, or, uh, on the radar as an option. Once they do, if they do relapse, so they looked at the 30% or so or more who relapse, they seem to do pretty good. That's what this survival line shows here. The German Hodgkin study group also drilled down a little further into this. They did not have a surgical arm to this, and this was all retrospective again, but they're able to cobble together 256 patients with stage 1A lymphocyte predominant with a whole host of therapies or, or treatment paradigms, I should say, whether combined modality, chemotherapy, radiation, radiation alone, or rituximab alone. The only one you see drifting down on the left a little bit is the rituximab alone. So it, you, I would generally say is probably not advocated, although, again, you could look at it the other way and at least look at a median of many years, still the majority of patients have not progressed. But at least in terms of all the other options, no, not a large difference, whether combined modality or radiation alone. Not a randomized study, and certainly you would need to do that to prove definitively, but I think, as, as I'll mention later, it's, uh, I would say, the, one of the more common treatments, at least if it's not in the chest or central, especially in the neck, and there are not secondary uh, uh, concerns regarding radiation, that low-dose radiation would be an option for stage 1 disease. So, you know, there's always different data to look at different views. This was a British Columbia, and they looked at radiation alone versus more what they called the ABVD era, and at least were suggesting that ABVD or chemotherapy with radiation would be favorable. I think we have to be a little cautious because it was different eras, and the radiation era was year, many years, decades ago, and the, was a more contemporary era. They tried to control for that 
in different ways, but I still think it's hard to prove that, that combined modality is better for this. And I can also say that there were not large numbers, as you can see, and especially they also included stage 1B and stage 2. So I think you start to get away from where we would agree that for not 1A, like B symptoms or stage 2, that radiation might not be the best course and combined modality would be acceptable. What about advanced stage? Again, that's a minority, only about 20% of patients. This was a matching study also done by the British Columbia and their, from their retrospective database where they, they matched patients. And that actually, those lines are not statistically significantly different, I should say, on FFTF. And what, the only thing I, should, I don't have on here, overall survival was the same. The only reason TTF was worse, so to speak, with LP is that there were late transformations. So we know that's an event, but when you look at overall survival, again, looking back over time, that it does not look to be drastically different for LP versus classical. But as I showed you in the case, it is strongly CD20 positive, and we do have a CD20 antibody. So that has been looked at initially in this uh, single arm study by Ranjana Advani. And the, as you can see, the characteristics there of the patients, some were untreated, some were previously treated. It was pretty active. 100% uh, response rate up front with a CR rate of 67%. Although there were relapses, though you can see over time uh, on the time to event on the left. So what about rituximab in chemotherapy, in particular ABVD? This is not LP, this is classical, and I don't recommend rituximab with classical Hodgkin's, but at least this was looked at in two phase two studies and shown to be, I would say, feasible. And at least in the, the uh, Eunice publication here, that the patients who received REBVD seemed to trend a little more favorable, in, as, as you can see here on the right. But that was not statistically significant. So I would just say it's feasible. Now, have there been other rituximab chemotherapy data? Yes, this is semi-hot uh, off the press a few months ago. It was over a several year period. But Michelle Finale at MD Anderson published this RCHOP data. And not a huge series, but you can see 27 patients using RCHOP. Uh, there was also about 13 patients who had, that's the other. The other was mainly ABVD or RABVD, but I think that's a hard comparison to make given the numbers and, and all of that. But I would at least suffice it to say that this data looks as good as anything else. Now, is it better than ABVD or RABVD? I think that's hard to say. There at least is a thought to use RCHOP just because of the transformation, uh, the proclivity to transform to diffuse SARS B cell, and knowing that we see these relapses. That is it more like, a little bit more like an indolent lymphoma. So this was a, another recent publication that was looking at a Swedish database that they were just trying to wrap their arms around the rituximab question. Again, all the caveats with retrospective comparisons, but at least when they looked at all rituximab containing versus non-containing, it did trend to be better. This is actually overall survival. I think that's a little hard to believe because that looks like 100% overall survival. Um, but, uh, but again, I, I think at least suggesting that there may be some benefit to including rituximab in treating advanced stage LP. What about relapse refractory? So I would say the first bullet is, is really critical and rebiopsy um, because of the second bullet, because there is that proclivity for transformation to large cell lymphoma. Now, if maybe there's a case where the LDH was skyrocketing up and you, you could tell clinically, but I think it's important. Sometimes we've seen cases where it's called LP initially and you rebiopsy and now it's a gray zone or it's changed hist uh, histologic subtypes. So I think it's very, very important. If it has transformed to diffuse SARS B cell, will you treat it like relapsed diffuse SARS B cell? You could do ice in an auto or think of other non-transplant options. But I think what's important to, to recognize is if it's relapsed and it's still LP, the prognosis is pretty good. And you don't have to rush to a transplant like you might think with classical Hodgkin's and some of the data you just saw. In fact, there's some evidence out there you could observe and really think of it a little more like an indolent lymphoma than a relapsed Hodgkin's or aggressive lymphoma. Rituximab single agent would be an option. If it's unusually localized to one place, even radiation could be an option. 
So in terms of, at least again, this is how I put the data together and treats. So stage 1A with out risk factors and nothing central, like not deep in the abdomen or uh, next to the heart, especially if it's in the neck, I think think about 30 to 36 gray of involved field or even involved node. Maybe, I've never had a case of a completely excised lymph node, but I guess that if someone came to me with completely clear negative margins and they were not uh, thinking of radiation or had some, let's say, history of stroke or something, we didn't want to give radiation, I think you could observe. Now, if there's risk factors, meaning B symptoms or multiple lymph node sites and they're stage two, I definitely would not recommend radiation, and I think I would just really start to view it more like a classical Hodgkin's. Now, do you consider rituximab? Is it RABVD? There's not randomized data. There's these suggestive series that are out there. I have to admit I have done that, at least RABVD, but think of treating that patient like I would a classical. So whether you're giving combined modality or chemotherapy alone, which uh, more often than not we'll recommend for early stage young patients. For, for 2B34, that should say ABVD or RCHOP. Uh, that's, I was meant to change that slide. So I, I, I would even, I would more commonly include rituximab with that, even though I know we don't have randomized data. I would I have to say since that, now that that's been published from MD Anderson, I am thinking more about RCHOP as frontline treatment, especially if there's that splenic involvement. But again, but again we're kind of veering off onto from prognostic factors, not true predictive factors like Dr. Diefenbach showed. And then relapse disease, if they're completely asymptomatic, really think about observation. Uh, at, usually at most, rituximab is, will really gain you close to 100% remission rate at least by many years of time, and some patients will go uh, for a decade or more. So summary, of course the diagnosis and pathology is critical. It's not a common lymphoma, and it's not even a common Hodgkin lymphoma, but especially for relapse disease. Just to be cognizant of the late relapses and especially the transformation to large cell. There is data supporting resection and involved field. Advanced stage disease, most people of course would treat with systemic chemotherapy. I think it's a dealer's choice in which regimen and also maybe a dealer's choice in whether to include rituximab. And to think about relapse disease a little more akin, not to say you can't have an aggressive relapsed LP that's not transformed, clinically, but I think mostly you can view it as more like an indolent lymphoma. I'd like to thank Dr. Abramson for the case and slides, and Dr. Advani gave is a really great how I treat in blood that I use for a lot of this, actually. Thanks.